Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. In 2004, a newspaper called the Southeast Outlook published this story. There are 21,800 patients per year who receive chemotherapy treatments in Louisville, Kentucky, and most lose their hair. When Lynette Leggett discovered this, it brought her to tears. She also learned that patients complain about being cold during the night and wrap pajamas or towels around their heads to keep warm. This gave Lynette an idea, but a challenging one. She said, I thought, I couldn't possibly meet that need. It seemed like an overwhelming project. Lynette's project was to create turbans for cancer patients who lost their hair. Some of her, some of her first creations were sent to a mother in Kansas. Lynette made the woman many caps for both winter and spring. Later, when Lynette met the woman's seven-year-old daughter, the girl ran up to her, wrapped her arms around her legs, and said, you made my mom so happy. She has a hat to go with every outfit. Lynette is known as the Hat Lady. From July 2002 to December 2004, Lynette and her six volunteers made 1,000 turbans, providing them at no charge to those in need. Lynette is a modern day Dorcas. She says, when you ask the Lord what you should do, you need to be willing to listen for the direction and recognize the opportunities that he gives you. In this episode, we'll learn more about Dorcas and Peter raising this kind-hearted woman from the dead. Acts 9.36 reads, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Joppa is well known to us from the Old Testament as being the harbor town that the prophet Jonah came to many centuries earlier that he might board a ship to go to far off Tarshish to run away from the Lord and his will that Jonah should preach in Nineveh. Joppa was a major seaport of Palestine located on the Mediterranean Sea about 30 miles northwest of Jerusalem. A Jewish kingdom believer and a follower of Christ lived in Joppa. A woman that Luke describes as a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. Far from being like Jonah, who ran from the Lord, this woman, as a disciple, only wanted to follow the Lord and to do his will. Her name was Tabitha, which was her name in Aramaic, Luke adds that this name by interpretation, or that is translated into the Greek, was Dorcas. This woman had an outstanding reputation for helping people in Joppa. She truly had a servant's heart. And verse 36 states that this woman was full of good works and alms deeds. There was nothing lazy about Dorcas. When she believed in Jesus as Israel's Messiah and began following him, she worked, and she found ways to serve her Lord. She was full of, or totally devoted to good works and alms deeds, or charitable deeds, being compassionate and giving towards the poor and those who were in need. With her alms deeds and giving to the poor, she did so without drawing attention to it. She did as the Lord instructed in the Sermon on the Mount. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. We have no record of one word that Dorcas said, but we do know about her work, and her life of servanthood and benevolence spoke very loudly back then and still to this very day. In Scripture, a disciple is one who learns from another, a follower, a, 
one determined to be like his or her teacher. In Luke 6, 40, our Lord said, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect or completely trained shall be as his master. And Dorcas was like her master, the Lord Jesus Christ. She had a heart of compassion, just like Christ, and her life of good works imitated him. In Acts 10.38, Peter told Cornelius that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. And this was the testimony of Dorcas as well, that she too went about doing good. Verse 36 states that this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Dorcas put her faith into action. When she saw a need or something the kingdom church needed to do, she stepped forward and did it. The needs of others not only moved her in her heart, but she moved and acted in response to the needs that she saw. And the construction of those words, which she did in the original Greek, mean that she continually did good works and charitable deeds. It pictured Dorcas as doing kind and good things for others over and over again and again. Her testimony was like what Christ taught in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Dorcas did not do anything heroic like Deborah, the judge and prophetess in Israel's past that God used to defeat the king of Canaan. She didn't do anything risky like Rahab and Jericho who hid the spies and helped them escape. Dorcas simply served her Savior selflessly by ministering to the hurting. She did many good deeds in quiet, sacrificial, and unassuming ways. She was a rich blessing to others. For this, however, she is lauded and honored eternally by the Holy Spirit in His Word. Acts 9, 37 to 38 read, and it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. As Dorcas was still faithfully doing many good works in helping others, she became sick, and tragically, this sickness led to her death. But then following her death, something odd takes place. The custom of the Jews at that time was to bury the body that same day. They had no means of preserving the body from decay, so they would have typically washed the body and then wrapped it in strips of linen, applying spices between the wraps in order to contain the smell during decomposition. Rather than immediately prepare her for burial, however, they just washed her body and laid her in an upper chamber, placing her body in the room above the main living quarters. Not finishing the burial preparation and then deliberately leaving the body where they slept and ate just wasn't done. In addition, dead bodies were defiling and an unclean thing under the law. Numbers 19.11 says, He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. Thus the Jews didn't let dead bodies hang around, and they buried them right away. But with Dorcas's body, they just washed her, laid her in an upper chamber, and did not bury her. This passage is sending a signal to us that the things normally done for a funeral were not carried out in the case of Dorcas. Instead, what is taking place is that they were preparing this woman for a resurrection. Because the next thing you see that they do, as verse 38 reads, And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. 
Lydda wasn't too far away. The cities of Lydda and Joppa were about 12 miles apart. Joppa was located on the coast and Lydda was 12 miles inland. This was about a half day's journey on foot. The disciples in Joppa had heard that Peter was nearby in Lydda, so two men were dispatched to call and beg Peter to come. What is fascinating is, what's fascinating about it though is that the message the two men were sent to relay to Peter from the disciples in Joppa expressed a sense of urgency, asking that Peter not delay to come to them. But Dorcas was already dead. This is unlike when word was sent to the Lord about Lazarus. Lazarus was still alive when Christ was asked to come. But here, Dorcas had already died when Peter was called. Luke gives us no record or indication that Peter was ever asked to, per to perform a miracle here. But we can surmise that that was their hope by calling Peter, knowing that Peter had a ministry that was marked by powerful miracles through the Holy Spirit. So in faith, these people in Joppa prepared for a miracle. They do not bury Dorcas. They put her in an upper chamber, and then they send two men to beg Peter to come quickly. Acts 9, 39 reads, Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. When the two men from Joppa found Peter and Lydda, they told him, told him about Dorcas's death and asked him to accompany them. Peter agreed to go. Peter was a leader who served God's people and was ready to respond to their needs and their call. Peter then traveled with these two the 12 miles back to Joppa. When Peter came to the house, he was brought into the upper chamber where the body of Dorcas was laid. And here, Peter saw firsthand how loved Dorcas was and what a loss her death had been for the believers and those in need in Joppa. Verse 39 says, All the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Peter met a group of widows who had been helped by her good works in alms deeds. We learn more about Dorcas's ministry here in verse 39, and we learn that she was a seamstress. She had a ministry to widows, sewing and making coats and garments for them. Widows were often poor at that time and could not afford to buy new clothing. And even though Joppa was a seaport city, there were no Old Navy outlet stores there. So with her money and sewing ability, Dorcas made clothes for these widows, being willing to help relieve the poor and bring comfort to the widows who lived in Joppa. In the chapter about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, she lived out these verses. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. When these widows stood by Peter, they didn't just say good words about Dorcas, they showed the good works of Dorcas. The widows displayed the gifts she gave them and showed Peter the kind deeds that Dorcas did among them while she was alive. They were wearing some of the very clothing Dorcas had made. Others had brought some to the house and as they surrounded Peter, the widows were showing or pointing out their clothes that they were wearing and all the other pieces that she had lovingly stitched, sewed, and made for them. And Peter saw with his own eyes the fruit of the ministry of this generous woman. The coats she made were tunics, the close-fitting garments worn next to the body. The garments were the looser outer cloaks and mantle that were worn over them. For some of the widows there that day, Dorcas had made everything that they were wearing. They were literally clothed in her compassion. 
What you see here also is that the fruit of Dorcas's ministry endured after she had died. It's been said that the legacy we leave depends on the life that we lived. And Dorcas left a testimony of kindness, goodness, and fruit for the Lord based on how she lived. And this is something we each need to stop and consider from time to time. What are we leaving behind? What will others say about us and show after we go home? Acts 9, 40 to 42 read, But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called, the saints and widows presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Next, Peter put them all forth. Peter used some gentle pressure and sent all the widows and any others out of the room where Dorcas's body lay. This was not to be a show. This mighty miracle was not to be done before a crowd. Peter did not want to draw attention to himself. He sought no personal glory. His goal was only to glorify Jesus Christ. There is no other record in Scripture that Peter had ever raised someone from the dead. But in Matthew 10, when the Lord sent out the 12 apostles, he had given them and granted them the power to raise people from the dead. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. After everyone was out of the room, Peter was alone in that upper chamber with the body of Dorcas. He then kneeled down and prayed next to the bed. Luke does not record Peter's words, but just the fact of his prayer and kneeling in prayer showed Peter's submission to God and dependence on him. Peter looked to the author and Lord of life to be able to raise Dorcas from the dead. Finishing his prayer, still on his knees, Peter turned to the body of Dorcas and addressed her by name and simply said, Tabitha, arise. And through the power and authority of the risen Christ, who has power over death, immediately she opened her eyes. She opened eyes that just a moment before had been closed in death. Her spirit returned, and her body was given life by the power of God, completely healed from the illness that had led to her death. And her eyes being opened, she saw Peter. And seeing Peter, she sat up. And my thought at that is her wondering, where did you come from? And sitting up on that bed, Peter then gave her his hand and lifted her up. Peter could have let her arise out of the bed on her own, but in kindness, he reached out to a sister. Then Peter called out to the saints and widows, telling them that they could all come back in. And when they returned, Peter presented her alive. And seeing her alive, crying turned to celebrating. Tears gave way to giving of thanks. Gladness replaced sadness. Peter had sent them out weeping, but he called them in to experience the rejoicing of reunion with their dearly loved friend. God's greater purpose for raising Dorcas is found in verse 42, and it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. When news of Dorcas being raised from the dead spread throughout Joppa, many believed in the Lord, and thus many were added to the kingdom church, like at the day of Pentecost. As seen in this miracle, the power of and Peter's ministry came from Christ, but the manifestation of that power 
pointed people to the Lord and toward faith in Him. God used miracles as confirming signs for both the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God during the Acts period. In this case, it was for the gospel of the kingdom, which Peter made known, and it confirmed to Israel the truth of Christ's resurrection and identity as her Messiah. Romans 11:15 reads, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? In our last episode, we looked at the raising of Eutychus in Acts 20. Eutychus was a young man and is a picture of the church, the body of Christ. In Ephesians 2.15, Paul calls the body of Christ the one new man. And God raised him and gave him life through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. However, for believers in Israel's program, they become members of not of the body of Christ, but of the bride of Christ. One day to experience Revelation 19.7, when she becomes one with her Messiah through marriage. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. God had promised Israel in the past that I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Here in Acts 9, Dorcas, a woman, is raised from the dead. Unlike the raising of Eutychus, a young man, as a picture of the body of Christ, a woman is raised here, which is a picture of the bride of Christ, and God raised her and gave her life through the ministry of the apostle Peter. Like Dorcas's life was full of good works, Israel's program is full of good works. Israel operated under a faith plus works gospel and program. Dorcas demonstrated James's teaching according to the gospel of the kingdom, that even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone, that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. But then Dorcas became sick and died, and her body was placed in another room. Like Dorcas, Israel became sick through her unbelief in her Messiah, and she died. That is, God's program with her ceased and has been put to the side, put in another room, you could say. However, Dorcas was not prepared for a permanent burial. She was prepared for a resurrection, and that is a reminder that Israel and God's program with her will be raised to life one day. Stop and think about where this miracle takes place in Scripture. Right before this miracle, Israel had fallen at the end of Acts 7 when her, when her leader stoned Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 9, God raised up a new apostle, the apostle Paul, to be the apostle of the Gentiles. God did that because he had temporarily set Israel aside in her unbelief turn to the nations to have a program with us within the dispensation of the grace of God. The death of Dorcas is a picture of what has happened to Israel. God's program with Israel has ceased. It has died. It has no life at this point. From this point forward in Acts, you see Israel's continual diminishing along with the continual rising of God's working among the Gentiles. We see Peter fade off the scene in Acts 15, but we see Paul rise to prominence in God's dealings. But Israel is given hope by the raising of Dorcas, that she and her program will be raised to life one day. This picture of the raising of Dorcas is what will happen in Israel's future. 
It is a picture of hope for Israel. Romans 11.15 reads, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Following the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, God will turn again to Israel. And it will be life from the dead when Israel is restored to her favored position. The bride of Christ will once again be in view and she will be prepared by God for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Like Dorcas, Israel in the future will bring forth fruit and be full of good works. Like Dorcas was raised through the ministry of Peter, it will be God's power working through the Apostle Peter's ministry and message in God's word that Israel will be raised up and given life and power. This is due to Peter being given authority over the kingdom church because Christ has vested in him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter's message and ministry at Pentecost and in early Acts, Peter's epistles, Peter's apostleship, Peter's confession as to the identity of Christ in Matthew 16, Peter's example in the Gospels will be what Israel will look to and follow following the rapture of the church. And remember that Dorcas was a tremendous blessing to others. And that reminds us of Israel's calling to be a blessing to all nations, all families of the earth. Peter reminded Israel of that in Acts 3.25 when he recalled God's words to Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Like Dorcas was raised from the dead, Israel, God's program with her, will one day be raised from the dead. And like Dorcas was a blessing, Israel will be a great blessing to the world. And it will result in what God's purpose always was for Israel and her rise. Many will believe in the Lord. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.